When the world has got you down and Alzheimer's sucks. It's an equal opportunity disease that chips away at everything we hold dear. And to date, there's no cure. So until there is, we continue to fight with the most powerful tool in our arsenal, love. This is Love Conquers Alls, a real and really positive podcast that takes a deep dive into everything Alzheimer's, the good, the bad, and everything in between. And now, here are your hosts, Susie Singer-Carter and me, Don Priest. Hi, everybody. I'm Susie Singer-Carter. And I'm Don Priest, and this is Love Conquers Alls. Hello, Susan. Hi, Donald. How are you? I'm pretty good. You know, but, hanging in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's going on? <laughs> um, well, usually we do a lot of rambling, but we have so much to talk about today. And we, we have really do. Uh, we have two guests and we've been uh, not that we don't love you, Zoom, but we don't used to recording our show on Zoom. So we're on Zoom today. So bear with us on our technical difficulties. So uh, Riverside did not work on the phone. Riverside, get it together. We love you. But, you know, <laughs> we're trying to have a show here. <laughs> so uh, a friend of mine, um, Harry James, did a wonderful documentary. It premiered at the Awareness Festival downtown. Don, you came with me. And, and Harry did a wonderful documentary on her son on the spectrum, who is actually a 2E, which, which translates to two times exceptional, and really gave a, 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 an exceptional <laughs> peek behind the curtain of what it's like to be on the spectrum. Long story short, Harry uh, called me and said, you have to see this short film. <laughs> Where is Nancy and this wonderful director? And you, I think you should have him in your show. And then thus today's show. The subject matter is very close to my heart because it is, um, it's based, you know, it's, it's talking about where the ones that you love who have Alzheimer's or dementia wander off and um which is basically the the premise to my mom and the girl i mean it was the day in the life of my mom wandering off and that wasn't the first time um luckily we had erlanda who was there her her caregiver and followed every step that she made but she also she also got out in a in an assisted living and i had got that horrible call one day that was like uh, don't, don't, don't be scared. Your mom got out and this was a locked, a locked facility for the memory care unit. I have no idea how she got out, but where there's a will, there's a way. And they said, we found her about three miles away. She's fine. Everything's great. We're doing her hair. She's happy. And I thought, oh, you, oh no, she's out of there. And, so, and I went, and that was the day I took her out of there. I was like, how, how are you not watching? I mean, my, I, it was, I was terrified. So the get, our first guest is Tiago Dedalt. Did I say that right, Don? You sure did. That was okay. excellent. Thank you. It's my linguistics prowess. Um, <laughs> I, he is a, he's a wonderful director. We watched his film, Chocolate, his first film, which was a fictional uh, depiction of someone with early onset Alzheimer's. Very early onset. Very, yeah, yeah, extremely. Early, yeah. early. And, um, and what, what can happen when you wander and you're not found? And it's, um, it's terrifying. It's, it's incredibly terrifying. And I'm sure so many people listening to this, unfortunately, have lived through, through that. And then out of, it's an extraordinary story because out of doing this fictional project, it's like, 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 like the universe does. And I'm going to let him tell the story, but it, it, it triggered a documentary mirroring this story of his fictional short film. This is just, it's just extraordinary how life leads to things and, and where you're supposed to be and you're meant to be because this documentary, Where's Nancy is just harrowing and real and through tragedy comes wonderful gifts, which is, you know, LA found, which has a program so we can keep a keep contact of our of our loved ones with Alzheimer's and dementia. So there's just so much to say about it. But yeah, it's, we're going to so we're going to meet. So we're going to bring on uh, Tiago uh, first. And then later think, on, we're going to bring on Kirk Moody, uh, who is 
the husband of the subject of Where is Nancy? And he has an amazing story and we can't yeah. wait to catch up with him. So I think it's time we should probably bring on Tiago and uh, we should stop yapping and let him start yapping. Yeah, get in here and yap, Tiago. <laughs> Let's welcome Tiago Dedalt. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello. How are you? We're great. Excellent. We're so Thank happy you. to have you here. There was so much to say about you because, you know, first of all, we feel very kismet with you. We both were Oscar qualified in 2018. How crazy is that? Th that was and, crazy. And for, yeah, I didn't even know that you were. And, and that we both did you know, projects on Alzheimer's. And I, I remember when we got qualified, you know, it was through, it was through um, Shorts TV. They, they found us and said, we want to qualify you because we love this project. And they said, but just, just know that, you know, Alzheimer's is not a popular subject. So don't expect to get, you know, go further. They were like very, very like blunt about it. <laughs> and I, and I'm so happy to see that you were there too uh it, it was a surprise too like i when i did this movie like like you say it's a fiction story i wrote really not based in anybody else and i i it was a surprise in many ways i didn't know much about film festivals some at that time the film went crazy in film festivals and so i was learning how that works and it, it was a lot of surprise there <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm not surprised because the, your quality and your and your story was was very powerful. And you know, as Thank you, you know, like in the it, we see very all different levels of of you know, production value and, and storytelling in, in the festival circuit. So, you know, and I and we're we've you as you know, right? You, we see it all, and it's you. It's it's <laughs> not easy. You think it's a short a short film should be easy? It's harder to tell a story, and and you know make an impact in a way that that you did Thank so you. and and, and what's yeah no it's beautifully shot and beautifully acted and directed um my question is what what inspired you to write something like this well i grew up in brazil and we used to see homeless people everywhere so mm -hmm. i always wanted to talk about homelessness in a in a different way, you know, people see like those people are there because they want to be there or, or because they're on drugs or stuff like that. So anyways, I always wanted to find a story that bring humanity to them. So anyways, mm -hmm. that didn't happen in Brazil. When I first arrived in LA, I was shocked by the number of homeless people. And I was like, I, I, I have to tell this story. I don't know how. So anyway, I started to write it down and trying to find a connection of things. I don't have anyone with Alzheimer's in my family, but I find out about early onset Alzheimer's. That was another thing that blowed my mind. And if you look up to the numbers, it's so many people. Uh, we Like the early onset of Alzheimer's is growing so fast. So I just found that link you know, to the story that I was trying to to tell. And then I was like, well, if I get a, this beautiful woman in her, you know, 40s and trying to have a, a great life and suddenly this happened. And I saw an interview online on YouTube with a woman, she was 37, if I remember, and she was pregnant. And she was already really advanced on early onset Alzheimer and her, uh, the doctor says she will have the baby and she would not remember she was pregnant. Uh, so that was really crazy for me. So I wrote this story. I have an amazing executive producer who loved this story and decided to make the film with me. And during that time we were getting close to shoot, but I try a couple organizations to talk about if that would be a real story kind of like close to reality anyways close to shoot to the shoot i got a message from a ceo from an um, organization in la she talked to me and she didn't like it this script she was like i don't think this is real i don't think someone like her gonna walk away and, you know, if it's real, she would be fine in two days, no more than that and something like that. So it was really 
not much in courage to to tell that story but we love this story it was a fiction i didn't base in any real story right so we decided uh -huh. to go and we made the film and we had a we we were about to have a premiere we showed the movie to the crew and then the actress who played um the alzheimer person on chocolate lead, yeah she went to the gym and she saw a picture of of Nancy and she texts me and say, hey, this is this is happening. And she got really involved. Uh, Kirk was having uh, meetings, you know, uh, gathering people to search for Nancy. So she joined them really fast and she got to know Kirk and and she invited him to come to the screening of Nancy of, of chocolate, which I I had no idea he would show up, and suddenly we sh we we had a premiere of the movie at the Land Landmark Theater, and then Kirk and his family came over and they watch it and they love the film. They came after uh, to the Q and A and talk about how close his story to chocolate was, and it, it was insane. It, it was like whoa, how you know if if it was a story that happened a little bit like you know in another state or in another city maybe i would not get to know about it but it was so right. close to us you know and so close to when we finished the movie that that was weird we still like me and kirk we still like <laughs> don't know much what happened there <laughs> in in chocolate um at the end you have uh, news reports uh that are reporting on early onset also it's very early in people in their thirties, mm -hmm. because when, when I first was watching and I said, wait a minute, this is, she's too young, you know, and I had an aunt who, who got early onset at 50 and, but you know, in their thirties and, but it seems as though it, it's actually, you know, this is happening. And when did you, at what point did you find those news reports? Was that during, after, or before you started shooting? Um, before, when we were prepping to shoot the movie, I was mm -hmm. researching a lot and getting all these videos, even to help um, the actress, Piercy Dalton. She she was researching as well for her character. So she mm -hmm. found some stuff she shared with me, and I found some stuff and shared with her because we wanted to see how someone in that age uh, looked like, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So it was more like researching during the process of making. Yeah, because it's interesting because you said you contacted somebody from the uh, an Alzheimer's so, and they said, oh, this is not believable. Right. That's too young. But it's not. It's not. It's, you know, it's, it's not common, but. Is that know. and you mentioned it was Alzheimer's Los Angeles? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So we worked very closely with Alzheimer's Los Angeles as well. And um, and I know now that they are supporting you because I saw it in, in your film. Yeah. And and I love that because. Here, here you brought you pulled the curtain back on something that you know people weren't paying attention to and even you know who and i love them so much like they are they they have been so supportive and uh i've been very involved with alzheimer's los angeles but honestly when i first was looking i wasn't going to direct my film because it was too close to me and when i was looking for a director initially people every director that read the script said yeah, but what about the woman? We need to know more about her. And I said, but that's not the story. That's not the way it happened. We don't know about her. And that's what's beautiful about it. And and everybody wanted to change the story. We need like, we want to hear this. We want to see that. And I was like, that's not the story. And I finally realized I have to, you know, stand by my story and fall. I'm going to either fall or, you know, I'm going to rise next to my story. And I'm glad that I did. And I'm glad that you did. I got to tell you, that's the heart that was the hard part because when you have a big organization that know what they're saying you know not that they don't know they really know and it was unusual unusual for them as well yeah. right so but yeah. but i mean the fact that me and my team we just like uh, -uh this story is too good it doesn't matter it's a fiction story let's go and let's make because when they shut us down, we could be just like, ah, oh, let's not make this movie, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Same with me. Same with me, exactly. And then, you know, and then when you go to the festivals and people are crying in the audience and hugging you, and you're like, oh my God, thank God I did this, right? right. And people are saying, you told my story. Thank you. That's my grandma. That's my mom. That's my sister. That's true. And you just, yeah, it's yeah. like, 
can't it doesn't get better than that that's true well you're which brings you're us wonderful. to telling yeah which yeah. brings us to telling the story that your next story which which is the story of nancy and of kirk and yeah. i think it, now's a good time to maybe uh introduce kirk moody who uh is the husband of the subject of where's nancy uh, and he has a remarkable story and I, and I hope everyone gets a chance to see this film because it yes. is, it's, it's very, it's so powerful and, and it's so important. Yeah. yeah. It's so important. So let's bring on, uh, Kirk Moody. Hello, Kirk. Hello. Thank you for having me on. Oh, Kirk. Thank you for thank being you. Thank here. Thank you for coming. First, my condolences for the loss of your wife. And I also think you're incredible and your tenacity and your, the whole family, your whole family was just incredible. And the way they all pulled together, it was just, I, I was in tears, like through the whole thing. It's just, just beautiful. So thank you for sharing it. I know it's not easy to share mm -hmm. that story and you did it and, it, and, um, and it's a gift thank to you. do that. So I, yeah, no, thank you. And everybody should watch this documentary. It's so important, you know, and it's funny because while we were watching it, Don was saying, well, why don't, why isn't there GPS tracking on these, you know, and I said, there is now, Don, there is now. <laughs> and literally you know? in the next three minutes <laughs> came up the, the concept of yes. LA Found, which yeah. you were so important uh, oh, in, in making happen, you know, um, it, it is, it is amazing. So yeah. going back to when you did, when you first met each other, what, I mean, <laughs> How did the how did the idea of the documentary come about? So I think that when I went to see the filming of Chocolate, that was just a, a month and a half or so after Nancy went missing. So we still had a pretty large group of people out actually on the streets, you know, looking for and interviewing people and and things like that. And um, and I'm um, I was in the um, publicity mode, right? I'm trying to get as much publicity about Nancy as possible and anything that looked like it might help with that I was willing to do so um the chocolate screening seemed like a good opportunity etc and so uh, um sometime later Tiago just sort of said you know this is as we continue to look for Nancy and not really have any success he says do we gotta I gotta film this story this is really the story that's going on I gotta make a documentary about this and it, and again I'm looking for publicity so I'm like sure you can follow me around and um, we're, we're pretty good friends and he's a really easy guy to get along with and he's very, very kind and, and very helpful. So it wasn't really, um, you know, much, didn't really take much of my time. So it was really helpful for him to, to do that as well. And, and getting more publicity for it was, off, you know, obviously a, a good thing as well. Of course. Could you, would you mind just giving a brief little summary of, of what the, the topic of the documentary is in terms of your wife and what happened? Sure. So um, we were at a family outing to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Um, and um, we're at the end of the day. And um, as people that, with loved ones with, that have, or if they're caregivers of people with Alzheimer's know, as you get a little bit more advanced, um, um, issues with going to the bathroom start to come up and so on. So I'm always trying to offer Nancy opportunities to go to the restroom. So we're about to leave. And I said, would you like to go to the restroom again? She said, yes. So we went and usually, you know, the men's room is right next to the women's room. And it turns out after I, after she went into the ladies room, I looked for the men's room and it's not right there. So um, I went and asked the security guy says, well, the men's room's downstairs. So I ran downstairs, went to the restroom and came back up and Nancy wasn't out yet. And a little unusual because she's pretty fast. And um, she also would, you know, would, would typically just wait for me or something like that. So I uh, waited a little bit, didn't see her. And then I walked around, thought maybe she came out and walked into one of the galleries or something. So I walked around a little bit, and certainly not panicked or anything like that, just kind of looking for and went and found my sister again and said, you know, have you seen Nancy? No. And I asked them to come, you know, go check out the restroom, see if she's still in there. And then we started looking a little bit more seriously. And then security at the museum um, sees us looking for somebody and they ask and they get right on it and they're they're looking around for it and everything and we looked for quite a while in the museum i, I might it's lacma is a really big museum and it shares grounds with the la brea tar pits and it's, it's a lot of ground to cover and we did that for a while and we finally said well we need to call the police so we called the police and they came out right away and um they um they started a search too and within like about an hour they put a helicopter up to look for uh, we, and we concluded she was no longer in the museum but we you wonder, you know, is she hiding someplace in the museum you don't know? And the museum actually does a sweep at the end of the day 
and we were getting towards that. So the police kind of wanted to wait for that. And um, anyway, it went from there, but she, she sort of disappeared into thin air and we had a huge group starting the next day. We, I mean, we were up to 25 people by the evening on the next day. And we had 50 people the day after that. And, um, you know, looking all over for her and everybody thinks they're going to find her right away. Mm -hmm. um, where was I going with that? So, oh, so um, somewhat later, you know, we found some videos of local businesses that would be willing to share with their cameras and stuff, which you would be, you, you can't believe how hard that is. It's like pulling teeth. And large companies won't do it without the police asking for it. And it's just adds, and the police would ask for it, but it just adds time, of course. And we sure. finally got a hit after a while, and she was walking west on Wilshire Boulevard. People are familiar with Los Angeles. And then we, um, over a period of about a week, we picked, we, we got as many videos as we possibly could, and we got her turning left shortly after that video, and then no more video after that. So that that was the last we kind of saw of her. And um, and we just kept looking. We started looking in homeless encampments. Um, hospitals obviously um retirement homes um you know libraries parks I mean, we just you know just looked and looked and looked and looked and um the police agreed with our methodology we get them in we took we we ranked the probability that she did this x yep. y and z um we did all these things and the police said, she, you know, she probably is not dead because you, it's it's really hard to hide as a dead person in Los Angeles. You know, you, you're going to be found almost for sure. So right. it may have seemed insane, but we just kept looking and looking and looking. I found it incredibly disturbing that it was so difficult to to get the get people to cooperate. And 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 it was boggling why all these uh, facilities that had Jane Doe's didn't you know, didn't report these Jane Doe's and take photographs of them. Well, that's, so that, yeah, and that, yeah. that brings up something that uh, we talked about. And uh, has it ever been discussed, because I know you've been through this, of creating a, a photo database that basically, if anybody walks into any facility, a fire department, anywhere, and they, they're not, so yes, they're Jane Doe, but if you had a photographic database, that literally would, with a description of the person, at least that anyone could go through and say, that's her, yeah. <laughs> you know, or that's so, him. Why, why can't we do that? Yeah, why can't we do that? All right, so that's a very hard problem. So I've continued working with LA Found and we've worked on a whole bunch of these problems. So on the photo database, it's getting a whole bunch of entities to work together. And it's a, it's a real challenge to keep it updated. So California has a database of missing persons, exactly what you're talking about with photographs. You can go there right now, you can go look at all the missing persons in all of California and do that. Unfortunately, not very many people know about that. So, you know, it's not, you go to, if a random person walked into a fire department and they were a Jane Doe, that's not the first thing the fire department's gonna think of. Now back to the it hospitals, <laughs> we, we did make some really good progress there. And we got a lot of cooperation out of the Hospital Association of Southern California, and we, we were able to write, we, I say we, that doesn't have nothing to do with me. It has to do with the people, the social workers that really got involved in this. And they wrote up a, a, a series of best practices once you have a Jane Doe. And a real issue in hospitals, your knee-jerk reaction to everything is, is based around the HIPAA laws. And you can't release any information about anybody. And they're very worried about that because you can go to prison for that, right? So they're very, very concerned about that. So but there are clear guidelines when it's a, when a missing person or a Jane Doe. And so we wrote out those guidelines and we've been able to distribute those to hospitals. We got a lot of buy-in from hospitals. They helped develop it. And I think that we probably have a much better system in place. Now, having said that, you have to train Wonderful. thousands and thousands of social workers on this. And I'm sure we're not there yet, but at least we have the groundwork in place to be able to do that much better. It's interesting. I mean, I'm just, I don't know, maybe this is naive, but I mean, when you get arrested, you, you get your picture taken, right? And it's, and it's, yeah, there, it's public, so right? Un, unfortunately, oddly, well, not oddly, if you think about it. So the police do have a pretty sophisticated database system and so on, but it's a criminal database. So the public's not going to have access to that. So if we wanted to piggyback on the police's database, it's only, it's only going to be for the police. And there's actually several instances of that where they've written some software to, um, if a person goes missing, it can get like right to all the patrol cars right away and stuff like that. So we don't have that in Los Angeles mm -hmm. yet, but we're looking at that, looking at how to get that in here. Yeah. 
Well, it Gosh. seems like there's promise. It's doable, um, I think. Uh, Tiago, when you started, when you decided to do this documentary, what was your plan? What was your, <laughs> you, you had to start somewhere. What, what was that? So what happened actually, uh, chocolate was going pretty well in film festivals. So I put a message about Nancy at the end of the movie. I was bringing flyers every time we, we had a screening. Kirk will, would show up if the screening was close by. So we tried to keep that going on, right? I, 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 by that time, I had no idea what to do because what, what, what everybody was saying, she's going to be fine. Like they're going to find her. So that was going on for about almost a year when during that time, Kirk and I were talking and he was telling me all these things going on in the system, like the possibility will happen and where she could be lost in the system and everything. So I, I talked with my executive producer, Drew Miller, and she was super excited as well to get involved and help. And I, I just called Kirk and say, hey, I want to tell you your story. It's an unbelievable story. And if you can help to bring Nancy, you know, that would be amazing. But I had no idea. To be honest, I'm not a, I don't consider myself a, a documentary filmmaker. Everything that I right. did before was commercials, was fiction, was actors. So I didn't know what to do, really. I just had a camera with me and Kirk would text me and say, hey, tomorrow I'm going to do this. Do you think it's something that you want to film? And then I would jump in and go and film. In the beginning, we, we tried to have a team and like a crew with a big camera and everything. It didn't work because, you know, you have to go inside these places and right. you don't want people come in and say you can film, you, you know. So it, it was challenging to kind of for someone with a background that I had to kind of let everything go to be able to simplify. Tell story. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. You simplify. simplified. Yeah. Yeah. Go, yeah. Yeah. Go small. Right. And, Absolutely. And the freedom was unbelievable, you know, but the story was coming in as we go. Like I had no idea what to expect, how would it be. I try not to write much because things were happening in front of me. So I was really mm -hmm. like, it was a huge puzzle to me. Like, I mean, it was a huge puzzle for Kirk to try to find Nancy and was a huge mm -hmm. puzzle to me to put this movie together. Like how this timeline of events, how we're gonna, you know, make this visually happen. But, and many times I, I, I came even to Kirk and to uh, George, it, it was so hard for me to film then knocking on doors and trying, and, you know, it was so unbelievable what they were doing. And I didn't want them to think that I was, you know, exploring their grief yes. or, Exploit you know? Yeah, yeah, exploiting, exploiting, you mean, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. And, and what was the time span from when you started till you got the, you found Nancy? Like where, what was that so, time frame? And let's say I started one year of her disappearance and one year later, we, we, we had the ending of the movie. So it was one year shooting, but it was another year of editing. So it was like two and a half years on the making of the movie. Right, mm -hmm. right. So you, so that's right. So you found, she was found a year later when, once you started. Yes. I, okay. I have questions for Kirk. My mother went through so many different stages, right? And, and in, in my movie, she was at that stage where if you didn't know, her and you didn't talk to her for too long you might not think she had alzheimer's right but she certainly would not be good on her uh, alone there's no way she could have been alone and if you asked my mother where did she live she'd tell you 6264 nita avenue woodland hills well she hadn't lived there in eight years but that's what she would say and i was thinking in my heart i was like oh before i knew the end i was like when when Nancy's parents were explaining that this is where they had lived since she was born. They've still lived there. I thought, well, maybe she's going to remember that address and someone's going to bring her there. And, and I'm, so I'm wondering what stage in her disease, what, you know, was she at, would she have remembered that? Do you get where I'm going with Absolutely. this? Right? So 
Um, one of the particular manifestations of Alzheimer's in Nancy was that she was becoming less and less verbal. So um, yes, she was uh, very unlikely to be able to blurt something like an address out. Not not impossible, okay. but um, pretty pretty unlikely. And she would also she wouldn't be able to remember the sequence of the numbers. It wouldn't that wouldn't come hmm. out. So she was pretty okay, pretty far advanced. And um, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, that that answers the question for me because I was thinking, oh, I wonder why someone didn't say where do you live, and you know, or you know. <clears throat> of course, we don't know who she met or didn't meet. Right. No. Nope. Right. I mean, and yeah. obviously, <laughs> yeah. if she was nonverbal, that's the chances of her actually connecting with Talking anybody. To somebody. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so, um, yeah. and it actually guided our, our search after a while, right? So, um, we did look at a lot of homeless places because that seems like a not on. You know, somebody could actually help her for a little bit and get her a meal or something like that. But in you know, almost all homeless situations, you know, if you go to a missionary, something like you stay overnight, they kick you out in the morning, and then you have to go find food. And so, unless somebody was leading her by the hand every step of the way, she wouldn't possibly be able to do any of those things. So it's, it's simply impossible that she could do that for any period of time more than you know just a day or two. And um, absolutely, we thought about a good Samaritan taking her and stuff. Well, I can just tell you as her caregiver, you know, it was a 24 hour job. I just it's almost, it's just beyond your imagination that anybody could be doing something like that. Um, so that's why you know, in the end, we're really concentrating on um, care facilities. And there are instances of care facilities having somebody with the wrong name, um, having somebody with, as a Jane Doe and not reporting it because they don't know how to do that. Um, and we, you know, we got these, you know, people would say, oh, this happened to my mother. And it took me six months to find her because she was under the wrong name or something like that. He's like, holy Toledo, this really does happen. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And that's why I was talking more about, you know, going back to the photographic thing is these people, you know, may not even know their own name. It's possible. And and so trying to match it up by names to me is kind of futile. Uh, it's you're, you're spot it's, on, it's the, ridiculous. You're spot on, Don. And, yeah. And they, um, a, a place called me, a place that I got, actually, Tiago's got, it's, it, it shows up in the film. I don't, don't tell him that, but yeah. it's, it's a place that we went. And they called me later on and says, well, we actually do, you know, after you came here, we thought about this, you know, we do have a lady we've had for two years and we really don't know what her real name is. You know, um, she just right. showed up and we've been <laughs> calling Marie this whole time. What should we do about that? And you know, my head explodes. Call the stinking police! Yeah. I mean, my goodness! Oh yeah. my god! Uh, but and and this goes back to if if the if it was only the facilities and hospitals. Going back to this photographic database, unless it was just them, you could you could save so many people. It's just like you know, the bracelets now save yeah. not thousands of people, but if you save one person, you know, then and and to me, as if a facility which is a a licensed facility isn't able to take a photograph and pop it up onto a database that doesn't make oh sense God. to me so uh <laughs> yeah well we're I, we do like it i said yeah. Donald, there's a lot of um um we're we're working on that I, it's just it's, yes, you it's so yeah. much harder than you would imagine it's so much more complicated no, i know i know it's, it's simple to me yeah, but. <laughs> it's, it's, it, in, to anybody the concept is trivial I, I agree with you i couldn't agree with you more but it, actually doing it is just it's just uh, it's turning out to yeah. be tough it's, yeah. yeah, it's it's the bureaucracy and the paper and, you know, just having to get through all those layers. It's so frustrating. It's it's our 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 family law system is a pain in the butt that way, too. I, I you know, I, I could go on for days talking about how that needs, you know, a complete do over. I couldn't help my mom. I'm, I'm her uh, conservative person. And yet I have no standing in court. Yeah. Well, and, and no Tiago standing. also talks to this woman who has an autistic son who who bolted and was in a hospital. And she calls the hospital and says, well, we can't tell you if he's alive or if he's dead or you can't come see him. You can't you do this. You can't do that. And she's she's his mother. That's awful. Right? It's just like right. it's a tragedy. horrifying, you know, it's, and of course, it's, it's, well, say, it's, well, yeah, we can, again, on. we can go no, on forever on this subject. <laughs> just in case the listeners are, aren't aware of this story that I've told before is that my mother was on her way, the facil her facility was taking her for just a regular checkup at the doctor's and she got agitated. And um, by the time she got to the hospital, she was raving, like, I don't know these people, they're kidnapping me. And instead of looking at her 
her records, they just assumed she was crazy and put her and locked her up in, in, you know, a psychiatry ward for seven days. And I didn't even get a call because she, they didn't strapped, strapped, strapped <laughs> tethered, tethered to a chair. And by the time I got the call, because my mother could only remember for some reason my sister-in-law's number who was divorced from my brother and they called her and she never had the wherewithal to call me. I finally found her. And you know, I'm also from LA. So she Kaiser had it was too full in their in their ward. So they sent her to someplace in uh, Porter Ranch. And I found her tethered and and you know, drugged with Depakot, which True. is like heavy duty psychotic black label drug black yeah. label drug and uh, she never walked again after that and she was like completely physically healthy and that was the you know seven days it took me to get her out of there so which is why i'm so um i talk about first responders in in all facilities including hospitals which brings up um you had a, a wonderful city council person <laughs> who uh, uh janet Hunt. She, yeah. yeah i mean from what i could tell just from watching the documentary this is a person who really cares and not only cares but does something about it yeah she's a and, very effective person she's a, she's actually on the board of supervisors of la county la county has 10 million okay. people which is more than all but something like 10 states and um she heard about nancy's story and she heard about um she asked, well, did you call this and this in the county? And I said, I called every county office you can imagine, right? And I had to call them all individually because they, there's no way to share information or anything like that. And she just was uh, very upset that the county didn't have a better coordinated response to that. So she really pushed to get this LA Found thing going. She's really the champion of it. And True. it's still going. And she's still the champion of it. And she deserves all the credit in the world for standing by that. And it's it's helped. There's 33 people have been recovered, right? So... There's 33 people Beautiful. that didn't have Beautiful. to go through something like I did. Yeah. Beautiful. That's it's amazing. And, bless bless and the, you and, and bless Janet. Yes. Hahn, I mean, honestly. <laughs> people say, oh, it's, you know, oh, th you know, people at 33 people. Oh, what's that? You know, compared to the, you know, millions. One person <laughs> makes a difference. If one person is found, it's worth it. And, you know, I, and I think that's what happens is so many times people just look at numbers and say, oh, it's not a big enough problem. That's well, not a big enough issue. But also Alzheimer's and dementia isn't, it, it, it's, it's, it's a marginalized disease and, until it happens to you. And so, you know, it's, a, it's one of those diseases that isn't, uh, you know, in a weird way, a, the sexy disease and people don't want to look at it. And, um, and it's misunderstood. It's, it's, it's massively, uh, horribly misunderstood. So that's one of the issues and it's not, it's given short shrift and it's been given short shrift. It doesn't get the, the financing, the funding that it needs for, for everything in terms of, you know, drugs, drug um, testing and all that stuff. So, you know, they don't get the best of anything yet. And that's why we're, we're all working so hard in every area and um, trying to destigmatize it so that people can understand that, you know, it's, it's a disease that, that actually could bankrupt us, you know, in, in the long run, because more and more people are getting it, people are living longer. And, um, and it's something we, we might, almost everybody's going to face at some point, just, it just will do. So and especially with early onset, because early onset, you know, it's not like, you know, yes, yeah, somebody might get dementia in their mid 70s, late 70s. But when you get it in your 50s, you can live another 30, 40 years with it. <laughs> that is I mean, my my aunt uh, had uh, early onset at the age of 50, and she was literally a vegetable for 20 years mm -hmm. laying in a bed, you yeah. know. Wow. Uh, it's, it's, it's not something that, you know, you get a disease and it's over in a year or two. It's just something yeah. that it's a, and it, and it affects not obviously the person, but everyone in their lives, as yeah. you well know. You know, I'm certainly preaching to the choir. Yeah, Tiago? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, one thing that I learned uh, with the early on set of Alzheimer's, as young as you get it, fast as it, it goes. Yes. Uh, like if you get on the 70, 80, you, you still can go a long way. But if you get younger, mm -hmm. the disease really go really fast. Progresses quickly. It, yeah, mm -hmm. progresses. Yeah. yeah, it does. And my, we, we had a, my mom made very close friends um, in one of the facilities with a, uh, a football player named um, 
uh, Fred, McNeil. Fred McNeil. Fred McNeil. Who, yeah. Yeah. Fred McNeil, who was 62 and had early on set from football playing and, oh, he was, he passed away in a year and it was unbelievable. This handsome, strapping, amazing man who fell in love with my mom, 20 years older than her, him. And it was like <laughs> this beautiful friendship based on music and, you know, just like that, just progressed so quickly and it was heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. And also for people that get it older, like my mom got it in her, I think in her late sixties, cause we don't, we don't know for sure, but I, I saw the signs and then early, early seventies, she was diagnosed and I call it the longest disease. It's the longest exit ever because we're now going on our 16th year. And um, I'm, lo I lose her every day, every day. I, you know, it's a new loss. So yeah. it's hard. That's it's hard, really yeah. hard. Kirk, had you had you seen any signs of wandering uh, at any time prior to this? Um, <clears throat> sort of, um, but the key was, and one of the things that um, is important to stress to people that are caregiving is you don't think of it in terms of wandering. So she was very attached to me. So when she was away from me, then she might bolt from wherever she was to go get back to me or get back home. And she was not likely to leave the home if she was, well, she wasn't going to leave the home if it wasn't with me. That's just, so you really don't think of it in terms of wandering. So it's, it's a little bit better to put it in terms of getting lost. It's much easier to imagine if you're a caregiver that your loved one is going to get lost or just, if you're just out of sight for a minute, they can, they can go the other direction and you don't know that and you come back and they're gone type of thing, which is sort of what, what happened to me. So I was conscious enough to, of the, of the threat of that, that I did get her that medic alert bracelet, which is a dumb bracelet. And if you, somebody finds her, hopefully they'll actually look at the bracelet and they call the number on it and stuff like that. But um, not everybody knows about those bracelets. I did hear one horror story about some guy who finally found his mother and went and picked up her stuff and, you know, went and picked her up and then looked in the hospital drawer where their personal effects were next to her, including the bracelet that they had taken off of her and stuck uh, in there, right? Uh, so, no, that's got to be a, a crazy case, right? That's just really unusual. But um, so in answer to your question, short answer is yes, I had thought about that, but I really didn't think of it in terms of wandering. I, I thought it in terms of she might get lost or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's good to, I mean, this is, you know, uh, for, for people who are, you know, it's always new for everybody when they're the caregiver of somebody, you know, uh, and so any signs, any information that we hear that can, you know, help you know, see if you know, you don't even know if it's a sign because you, how do you recognize it? You don't, you've never gone through it before. Exactly. So that's why putting out your story is so important and, and so generous of you. Uh, and, and we, we can't thank you more for that because this is how, this is the only way we learn is through other people's experience. It is an important when, story. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah I'm, and um, I've used it. I, you know, there's um, this afternoon I'm going to fly to Sacramento because the California Missing and Unidentified Persons Department gives a training course on missing and unidentified people. And they actually, I give a module on that, on what my experience is in Nancy going. This goes to law enforcement and so on. So these people are getting trained. They're getting better about finding out about these things. But it's a, as you can, you know, there's new police all the time. And they all have to be trained. So it takes a long time. Yeah, and your 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 process was really detailed and intense. The, the the you know what you had done and what you put in place for your search was was extraordinary, and um, I'm I'm very um, privileged to have the resources and the friends and the time to be able to vote that. And you know, very few people can do that type of thing. And uh, even and, with nor that, did they we have were, the wherewithal. We were essentially unsuccessful, right? We you know everything we did didn't didn't work basically, so. Right. Getting to the day that you, they found her remains and, and, uh, and you know, I, I, I lived in Sherman Oaks for 14 years on Valley Vista, yeah. if you know where that is. Right. Yeah. And um, I'm very familiar with that area. And I find it extraordinary that, that they, that she had gone from Lacoma to Sherman Oaks and, um, and the the very little entryways that that she could have gotten there, and it it 
it must be something that haunts you to, to think of how, how, since there's no answers to how she got there. Yeah, so oddly, yeah. I don't dwell on that very much because it turns out that there's yeah. no good answer there. So it doesn't. It doesn't yeah. make a difference. It, it, yeah, it, it yeah. doesn't matter, yeah. you know. And um, true that. So I, it, it bugs her dad a little bit more, but I think he's kind of let that rest as well. But it's just like we're, we're there's no. I can't imagine how we would ever find out more information about it. So that's just yeah. the way it is. It is what yeah. it is. It's, it's and the way you is. and her, the way you and her parents have handled this, you know, with such grace and such, because some people would, would just want to hide and not, you know, and just disappear from it. And, but you, you've thought of others and, and all of you have just by agreeing to participate in this film. Uh, and so for that, you know, you should be, I mean, you should be commended because it's not easy. I mean, I, no. I can't even imagine. I didn't so, want to do my story. I didn't. <laughs> No, I didn't. I'm a little I, you know. unwilling participant. You don't want to see yourself on the Channel 2 newscast crying in front of the camera, but if it gets people to look for your wife, then you, that's what you do, right? So Yeah. A yeah. And Tiago, yeah. you handled it also with, you know, you just with such a, a beautiful hand, the way you, you dealt with it and the way you dealt with them, because you know, you a, a documentary can be very intrusive. I mean, these are yeah. people who are, you know, in the in this crisis, and the way you dealt with it was just beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it was hard. It wasn't easy but for both of us. I mean, for them to have a camera in their faces probably was awful, and for me to feel that that I had a camera in their faces was awful too. But uh, they they always remind me um, the importance of show the story and help to find her or even help to find somebody else, you know, because we never know who's going to watch and it's gonna, if it's going to help to other counties to have the bracelets, you know, yeah. it's like to say, it's not millions of people being found, but this is the, the, the small person that can get to the millions, you know? Absolutely. No, I, 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 I am so admire both of you. I'm like, my heart is bursting from, both of you are just extraordinary. And I, I'm not saying that in a flippant way at all, because it's so, it just touches me deeply. And um, um, I really don't, I don't know what else to say about this. I just think that everybody needs to go see, go see, so watch both these films, because you really need to see the juxtaposition of chocolate being a fictional story. And then, and then it's segueing into this, you know, non-fictional true life story that, that is, tragic and 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 yet such a gift in many ways to all of us a huge gift for us and generations to come uh people usually ask like to ask me like how do you vision about making this film and the ending of the film we had no idea in my mind we would find her and film or would it be an open end you know you'll be like we're still looking for nancy if you have information and everything so when Kurt called me, it was close to Christmas, right, Kirk? Yeah, day after Christmas. Yeah, and, and it was just like, oh my God, like I, I don't even knew how to finish the movie. It was so heartbreaking. And, but again, they're amazing and they let me film and do everything after. And I mean, this movie only ha happened because they're so open. And, you know, as you, you are a filmmaker, you have to have that type of people that allow you to to be close enough to show those mm -hmm. parts that maybe nobody want to show. You know, absolutely, yeah. I I totally get that. And I, you know what? Let me take that. I have one other question for Kirk. Is that that the investigator when he was going through, you know, the the map from LACMA to uh, Sherman Oaks and trying to, to hypothesize what may have happened and talking about Alzheimer's patients that generally go straight and then right, straight and then right. And, and then you said when Nancy, you on the, on the cameras that, you know, on the street cameras, you saw her go down Wilshire and then make a left. Right. So, yeah, so that, that so that's a friend of mine who, who just really looked into this quite a bit, Matthew, that talked about what, you know, sort of general rules that people will follow. And another one was that they typically da go downhill. So it, you don't know. These are just very, very general types of things. And, and Nancy was, uh, mm -hmm. she was young. She was very healthy and a very good walker. So 
um, she, going uphill would not bother her at all. In fact, that might even be something she would want to do, you know. Right. Um, and um, he, you know, he maps out a path that she could take, which it, it looks funny, but if you kind of just follow along these roads, it's not that funny. It's something that she really could have done and ended up there. And I, sure. and I think in, in to Don's point, when he says, are we, you know, curious about it? Sure. But I, i kind of choose to believe that's what happened that she walked up there maybe that very night and, and uh, that's where she was. And um, it's a very common thing with Alzheimer's patients when they do wander, what happens is they get into a situation where they feel trapped or they're, they're, they're at a dead end. And any normal person would know to just turn around and walk back out or back out or something like that. And, and they're, they're not, they can't process that. And they end up in a bad situation. And that's, that's very, very right. common um, for wandering and Alzheimer's. And I, I think that's right. something that may have, may well have happened to her. Interesting. Yeah. I was, cause I had not heard that about that, you know, the, the consistencies of that. So I thought I found that interesting as well. You know, I, I, I didn't map out when my mom got out of the facility in Burbank, but I remember them saying they found her three miles away. I thought that's far. My mom was really healthy and walked like, like Nancy, very extremely, you know, athletic. And I, I, it didn't, but in the short time that she was supposedly gone, she went uh, three miles. That's yeah. far, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So Although when it, she got it in the film, when, you know, which depicts, which was, we actually shot that in the home she was at when she got out, she did, she went right and then right. Yeah, we were know. trying to go back and see what <laughs> was it right and right, because Erlanda, yeah. her caregiver, had it all mapped out, you know, so, but we did take her, we fictionalized a little bit where she was so we could shoot, yeah. you know, at, but, yeah, but anyway. Um, it's wow. interesting, yeah. It's, it is interesting. I want to ask Kirk, like, how can people get involved? What can they do with what you're doing? Uh, what What's Help the support. best way if, yeah, to support If they're this. a caregiver and they're in Los Angeles, they really ought to look into LA Found for their loved one. That's, it's a set of resources that it's not just getting a bracelet, which they can get, which is very important. But it's other, um, there's tips on there from Alzheimer's Los Angeles about how to keep them in home so they don't wander in the first place. And so there's very valuable resources there. Um, they can support the Alzheimer's, uh, both the association and Alzheimer's Los Angeles. Um, great. I'm, I'm a board member now of Alzheimer's Los Angeles. It's a great organization. Oh, I love it. Um, Wonderful. I love Heather Cooper. Shout out to Heather Cooper. She's phenomenal. <laughs> I think that woman could run the yep. world. I vote for yep, her. Yep, she. I vote. I vote for her too. I love them very much. So, um, and uh, just awareness of it. You know, even if you're not a caregiver, or, uh, just awareness of the issue and being um, a good listener to people that are having the issue and say, "Oh, you know, um, I've heard of this LA Found program, or I've heard of Alzheimer's Los Angeles, or something like that," and, and giving people that resource and. Um, those that's I think that's really a good way to go forward. Absolutely. We're going to do put I put all that information and all of those links in the show notes. You will have every link LA for Alzheimer's Los Angeles, LA found um, links to the films, links to the to films. The, absolutely. Yeah. Support, support these people, support yourselves by, by getting involved and, and really, you know, helping to, to, to sp spread this message, which is so important. Yeah. And, um, and and Tiago, what do you have going on right now? I know you've got a lot of projects going and I'm sure you working on this has probably colored how you work on these projects now or what you're working on. Actually, we had a, a beautiful premiere of Where is Nancy at the, um, the CineQuest uh, Film Festival at the Silicon Valley. Um, <laughs> and we had this screening on Sunday, March, uh, I, I forgot the date, but it was a day before they shut down the, the entire country for the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it was really awful for the movie. I mean, all the filmmakers, we were all struggling with this pandemic thing. But uh, during the process of making Nancy, I, I met someone who knew a woman who has two autistic sons, an unbelievable story. So during the pandemic, I start filming her story. So that's what I'm finishing 
right now. I, I did a, uh, I have a script of Chocolate as a Future Film that I really want to make one day. And, but, and we are also um, trying to have, to find a, a, the best streaming platform for Where Is Nancy? I hope we're going to know that soon and spread the word about her story and hopefully help others who wonder and, you know, make sure LA found is uh, copy everywhere. Yep. Excellent. Love it. Love it. Love it and love you. Thank, Thank you, you for being such a it. responsible caregiver and, and a passionate care. I mean, filmmaker and uh, and a caregiver. But that's because you're helping. <laughs> you're helping in a, in an adjacent way. I appreciate. So it. thank you. Now, thank you. It's it's really rare in our in our industry. You know, I'm sure you you came up, when we did chocolate. I'm sure you got a lot of you know people saying, oh, Alzheimer's." Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. the same like when the pandemic came and yeah. tried yeah. trying to sell the movie, and people were like, "Oh my God, we're going to the pandemic. You want me to watch a movie about Alzheimer?" Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what well, I mean? That's why we called yes, ours. We do. We, <laughs> we called ours a joyous look at Alzheimer's because I wanted people to lean into it. Like I had to learn to lean into it and find the the gifts, you know. And even like you, like you, Kirk you found the gift in it because you now are uh, giving it to everybody. And, um, and that's, that's, that is the beauty of, 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 the, of tragedies is that we can pay it forward. That's why I'm here paying this forward. I appreciate, I appreciate LA uh, Alzheimer's Los Angeles for being so supportive to me and us against Alzheimer's in Washington, who is our fiscal sponsor, uh, all these amazing our organizations and the Jewish home in Los Angeles that has supported my mom and will continue for the rest of her life. And, and we need more, we need more compassionate organizations. So we, I have loads of love yeah, and we, respect. We're not going to stop Alzheimer, but we can make people understand what's going on and stop yep. the wonder, stop situations like Kirk went through, you know, and Absolutely. That's, that's my hope. Yeah educating and demystifying yeah. and, and destigmatizing and wow thank you is there anything we left out that you'd like to talk about if not i just want to say thank you <laughs> no well, thank you very much for having us on again it's good it's nice yes. to meet you absolutely i appreciate yeah, it absolutely. It's, a, it's a pleasure and um we will we again thank you so so much kirk you're amazing you're just an incredible human being i just i don't know you but i feel like i know you and i like you so much so yeah, thank you That's thank kind. you <laughs> yeah I, I do i do you're just um you just have a heart that is huge and um and you're brilliant on top of it so bless your heart and you too you too tiago you. and don you're okay you're okay don i'm fine right i'm okay you're all right in my book <laughs> <laughs> Well, what do we always say, Don? Yeah, well, I mean, this whole everything in the long run, all of this has come from love. And, and that's really what all of this is about. Because as we always say, uh, love is powerful, love is contagious, and love conquers all. And we'll see you next time. See you next time.